Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, this is Redberry Wheel here, and welcome back to one of my wonderful Learn to Lead videos. Now, I know some of you have been waiting for this for a little bit. I posted my chapter three about three months ago, and I said it would be posting more, so here we are today. We are going to be discussing what you need to know for the Learn to Lead book chapter four. So if you haven't previously watched the earlier content for the other chapters, I highly recommend you look at those. And there's two different videos that are associated with this video, and I won't be going in as much depth in this video on those two concepts, and that would be the leadership matrix and the seven responsibilities of an NCL. If you want to check those out, please, wait, I think it's on this side. Please check out the I card up here and let's just jump into it. So the beginning of the chapter talks about professionals and it says that leaders are professionals. Now, wait, what does this exactly mean? Well, this means that when you are a leader, then you should treat others with respect. You should hold yourself to a higher standard and you should do the best you can in everything that you do. And it says that both NCOs or non-commissioned officers and officers are both supposed to be professionals in whatever field they are in. Now in Civil Air Patrol, we're all volunteers, so we should be putting the community before our own interests. Something that Learn to Lead wants us to be prepared for before we get into being an NCO is to understand like what it means to hold people to a standard. What is a standard? Think about it. I'll give you some time. Okay, a standard is the measurement tool to which you compare people's performance to your expectations. Now, one thing that I want to say in addition to this is that you always have to set an expectation before you can hold people to that standard. So for example, if I just got to be put into the position of squadron first sergeant and I'm doing inspections, uh, before, before I do inspections, I'm going to review the standards at least once like maybe the meeting before in order to make sure that everyone knows, okay, so this is the standard that I am being held to. And then if they don't meet that expectation, then you do your best to bring those members up to speed to get to where that level of expectation is for everyone in your team. The next portion of the Learn to Lead book discusses the responsibilities of an NCO. So remember, check out the iCard for that. We're gonna move into NCO readiness, which is basically being mentally, physically, and technically aware of your surroundings and being prepared for different scenarios. When you become an NCO, the expectation is that you have experience and that you're willing to share that experience with other people, whether it be in your unit, whether it be at some kind of activity like encampment, you are supposed to have some foundation of knowledge before you go in as an NCO. So being ready by getting enough sleep, drinking plenty of water, reading up on materials that might be applicable to your job, those are the kind of things that you can do to have that NCO readiness that the Learn to Lead book talks about. What is servant leadership? Do you know what servant leadership is? It isn't where like you're, you're a servant and you're leading people, or is it? It's supposed to be a little bit of both where you're putting your people's needs before your own. So something that the book talks about is avoiding being a leader that pulls rank. So if, for example, there's a cadet airman and a cadet second lieutenant, cadet airman isn't listening and the cadet second lieutenant says, excuse me, airman, do you know who I am? I am second lieutenant um, shish kebab and you will address me as such. That may not be taken very well. It may not go over very well. You may not receive any respect <laughs> from people who are following you if you pull rank on them and saying, I am a higher rank than you, so you automatically have to listen to me. Typically, Trust and respect is a two-way street. So if you are respectful to that person, if they aren't listening, you say, hey, get out so-and-so. Could you explain to me why you were doing this? If you can give me a substantial reason that is um, explaining why you were doing this, then I will acknowledge that and we can move forward. But if there isn't a good reason for why you're doing what you're doing, then let's cease that behavior and move on as a team because I want to make sure you're succeeding and I want to make sure 
the whole unit is succeeding. And maybe that person would be a little bit more receptive to it than, you know, Second Lieutenant Shishka Bob being like, Look at my rank. You will listen to me and you will address me as such. That doesn't go over well. So this chapter also talks about coaching. What? What is coaching? There are a few different aspects that it goes over. It talks about making a dialogue, empowering your people. It talks about taking actions and improvements that lead the team towards success. Having a dialogue and making sure that people on your team feel like they're being heard can really empower them or make them feel like they're contributing, which can increase the overall effectiveness of your team. Now, successful coaching is based in observation. So not just immediately stepping in and saying, oh, you're messing this, this, and this up. You can let people fail. It's okay for people to fail. Soft failures are okay. Hard failures are also okay, but it depends on the context and the circumstances in your relationship with the person that you are coaching. So as you make observations, you can use the feedback sandwich, which is, which is like using the positive, negative, positive technique where you say something good at the beginning and you've got the meat of it and how to correct it. And then you've got something to remind them that they've been doing an excellent job. Because you want people to feel like they have been contributing in a positive way and that they want to continue to contribute in a positive way. If they feel like you don't appreciate what they've been doing, then they're less likely to actually feel motivated intrinsically to help the group. Additionally, while you are coaching people, it's good to follow up with them as you are guiding them and mentoring them, just so that they don't feel like they're lost. Because if you just like tell them this thing once and then you never check in on it, then they might forget what you told them or they may not have effectively done it and they were just too shy to ask you for help. So by you taking that initiative to check in on the person that you're coaching, that can really help them have a greater trust in you as their mentor and coach. So another thing that the book discusses is constructive discipline. There is something in the past that is called hazing that was used as a training technique where basically they would say like, give me 10 push-ups if you don't have a uniform that's properly done. Here, stand here in this field for 30 minutes at attention for one person falling asleep in the van on the way back, right? Those are not effective tools for discipline. Now, I'm not saying you can't do discipline, but there are a few steps that you can take to make sure that it is constructive or effective and the message is more well received by the person that is receiving that criticism or that feedback. So there's a difference between lacking the ability to do something and lacking the motivation to do something. Sometimes people just aren't as competent as you might expect them to be with something. So for example, drill and ceremonies. If someone isn't properly doing those maneuvers, then like they just may not know how to do it. And just yelling at them in front of everyone else, it's not gonna work very well. So what I've personally done and what a lot of leaders do is they, they do criticism in private where you might have that one-on-one -on -one conversation or you might say, hey, make sure you lift your left toe instead of your right toe when you're doing that facing direction, okay? Then that, that private setting is not as embarrassing and they'll be more receptive to it rather than them feeling like you're calling them out in front of the entire group. Additionally, if you have something good to say, then you could say, hey, Cadet Shish Kebab did an excellent job with that drill movement. What part of it did they do well? If you are specific with whatever they were doing well, they're gonna continue doing what that was, and then they will look for further areas of improvement that will increase how successful everyone is in the team. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it amazing how it works? If someone is behaving in a way that you believe deems um, some constructive discipline, you need to do it in the right time, in the right place. You need to praise them for the things that they've been doing well. You need to control your emotions and you need to focus purely on what that person was doing and not the individual themselves. If the leader says, you did this wrong, you did that wrong, you did that, you did that, you did that. You are a bad cadet. Saying someone is a bad cadet 
is not gonna fly. People will not respect you for that. But if you say, hey, the drill movement that was just completed has some room for improvement. You weren't able to turn around, I see. So let's work together to improve this. Let's say someone didn't organize their foot locker for encampment. Okay, let's walk step by step through that. At the beginning of encampment, you probably taught them, this is how you set up your foot locker. And they'll be like, okay, I understand. So they have the knowledge and they may not be super familiar with it, but you've taught them and there might be a chart that shows them how to set it up. Number two, if you are giving them feedback about them not setting up their foot locker for the inspection, I like to ask them the question of why? Why is the foot locker not set up for inspection standards? And this, this is a somewhat direct question, but I think it's a valid question because it's like you're trying to understand what prompted the behavior. And if that person's like, I didn't feel like doing it, then that's where you take that next step of saying, I understand you may not have had time or like addressing whatever reason it was, but everyone is being held to the standard and I expect every footlocker to be set up in this way. Does that make sense? Or do you understand? And then if that person understands, then you can reaffirm and say, I think you've been doing a great job with this, this, and this. Maybe we'll have your wingman check your footlocker before the inspection just to make sure that both of you are on the same page and to make sure that you're holding each other to a good standard. And that way you're bringing in some help and someone who is on the peer level of the person that is following you. You're not going to say it in front of the entire barracks if someone didn't like put their footlocker at inspection levels or expect expected standards for inspections, but having that one-on-one -on -one conversation can increase the trust and respect between you and that follower. The book also talks about motivation. Motivation is the reason why people do things. There's intrinsic, which is the internal motivation, and extrinsic, which is the external motivation. So external, an example would be, I am giving you money to do this task. An example of intrinsic motivation would be, I want to do this task because this is important to me and I want to get it done. So like if it's my personal goal to complete my Wright Brothers achievement, for example, then I am internally motivated because it's like, I want to get to that level because I believe that my experience matches that level of a cadet staff sergeant. So I believe that it would be in my best interest and in the interest of my squadron if I try to promote and get there. Those who are intrinsically motivated typically are more effective in getting their tasks done than those who are extrinsically motivated. Like if someone is working retail and they're just working there for the money versus someone who is volunteering at Civil Air Patrol because they want to be there and they want to serve. So those, those are two different things. They're both reasons why people do stuff and that's good to understand. But if you are intrinsically motivated, you're going to be more successful in that endeavor that you are doing. There's a relationship between NCOs and officers, and I'm gonna talk about that briefly. NCOs are more on the short-term thinking, where they think about like short-term needs, like what does the flight currently need to be working on in order to meet our long-term goals? The officers are setting those long-term goals. So if you think about mission, vision, and command intent, those are things that are set on the higher indirect leadership level. And then the like tactical, level of leadership is being led by those NCOs. So I did talk about the leadership matrix in a separate video, which you will see in the IR, I, I card up here. And that video will talk a little bit about those different levels of leadership. And it even has visuals. So if you wanna check that out after this video, please feel free to look at that. Additionally, there's difference between fulfilling, setting goals. The NCO is helping ensure that those goals are fulfilled and the officer sets those goals. There's getting the job done versus setting the team up for success. Officer is setting them up and the NCO is getting it done. So the NCO is basically the boots on the ground for the officers who are trying to ensure that the organization's goals are being met. How do NCOs support higher level leaders? I do have an acronym for this. It is called CIRCU. So there is Command Intent, Initiative, Respect, full descent, completing staff work, and update and advise. So the command intent is what the, 
the officer has decided is the best way for the organization to move forward and they share that command intent with the NCOs. The initiative is where the NCO says, okay, these are areas that we need to work on, so I am going to do it before I am told we need to work on it in order to just be mentally prepared for what we need to work on next. Respectful dissent is when you you have your thoughts and you, you get one but sir or but ma'am. What does that mean? If you have something that you just don't agree on for like a decision that's been made. So for example, if there is a squadron meeting schedule and it says that you are doing drill and ceremonies for two hours, then as the NCO, you might notice this and you might say, hmm, we aren't meeting our contact hours that are listed in the, the regulations that say, well, you need to do a certain number of hours of aerospace, character development, leadership, and by doing two hours of drill, you won't be meeting those contact hours. So your but one, sir, to second lieutenant Shishkabog might be, hey, sir, I realize that the schedule says that we're doing two hours of drill. Is there a specific reason for that? And if you ask that question, then you may gain a better understanding. And then if you still disagree with that rationale, you get that one but, sir. And you would say, sir, I understand that we are doing this drill. And I highly recommend that we consider doing this block instead because we need to meet those contact hours as a squadron. And I'm not sure if we'll actually meet those hours if we're doing drill for two hours. And then that's it. If the, if the commander agrees with you, then that's great. Then a positive change has been made. But if the commander doesn't agree with your recommendation, then it's it's the commander's final decision. It's it's their call. And if if you feel like it's like a really egregious thing, then you can talk to the person in charge of them. But that can also be considered skipping the change depend skipping the chain depending on the circumstances. So just be careful about those situations. You can have respectful dissent. Respectful, respectful dissent. But just be careful about those situations and making it more about what the team should have and not about your personal interests or using I and me and I think and I I know. Because if you use those too much, then they might see that as more of a personal thing rather than this is for the benefit of the whole. Okay, so I am going to be doing a video, if I haven't already, on the seven needs of a team. I think I already did, but I'm not sure. So I'm not going to go into those. Those are in the book, but I'm not going to talk about those right now. The last part I am going to talk about is the lead model and the team life cycle. So the team life cycle, it goes forming, storming, norming, performing, and then adjourning afterwards. But it's, it's like a nice little circle. And you don't always adjourn, sometimes it just rotates between those four of forming, storming, norming, and performing. Forming is when the team just, like, it's created. Storming is where, like, everyone is disagreeing and there's, like, a bunch of arrows pointing everywhere. The norming is where everyone starts to normalize and, like, understand how the team works together. And then performing is the most effective part of the team lifecycle process. The lead model is where you lead with a clear purpose. You empower your people, you aim for a consensus, and you direct the team. Okay, so that about summarizes chapter four. I know this was a little bit longer of a video, but I think it will be useful and I will have visuals throughout this video, even though I just spend about 20 minutes talking. <laughs> so I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, please feel free to leave them in the comments down below. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and that is all, folks. Until next time, doodles.